There's a voice, there's a name, sorry. There's a name I call in times of trouble. There's a song that comforts in the night. There's a voice that calms the storm that rages. He is, he is Jesus. That's right. That's what this song says, and I would appreciate it if you would stand along with me and let's worship together. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation. There is no one like you. 
Father, just the speaking of that name. The name Jesus brings power, brings comfort, brings strength, brings peace. brings healing. Jesus, there is no one like you. Jesus. We've gathered in this place, Lord, for the purpose of lifting high your name so that the world can hear and so that our hearts and our lives and our minds can be turned to you. Thank you for blessing us with your presence this morning. Thank you for loving us so much that you gave Jesus in my place and in the place of each one of us. For it's in his precious, holy, powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated if you would. In the pew rack, hopefully in front of you, you'll find a, a card. If you see that card, would you, and you're, and you're a visitor with us this morning, would you take it and fill out some information for us? When I say a visitor, I'm talking about someone who maybe has never been here before. But we'd love to have a record of your attendance. And so if you would fill that out, we would appreciate it. And then on the back side, there's a place for prayer requests. We all have prayer requests, and so that, this back side of the card is for all of us. So would you take time just to fill that out for us so that we can have the pleasure of praying along with you? I'm glad to see you this morning. Those who have joined us by way of Facebook and YouTube are glad to see the back of your heads this morning, but they would love to see your face. So as the music begins and you stand, would you turn and wave to that camera, and then would you speak a word of encouragement to one another as we stand together? Congregation, you may be seated. We're singing about Jesus this morning. One of my favorite songs of all time says, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Let's sing it together. <clears throat> I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be there. I'm 
church. If you would remain standing, we're going to turn our Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 3. It's going to be in Mark chapter 3, reading verses 13 all the way down through 19 this morning. So beginning in Mark chapter 3, starting with verse 13, it says, And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Church, will you please pray with me? Jesus, we thank you so much for this morning. You are worthy of worship. You are worthy to be praised. Jesus, I pray this morning that you would communicate to us that you love us, you have chosen us, regardless of the sin in our life, you were crucified on our behalf. And we don't have to live under that bondage anymore. You called these men out that we just read who were of little importance, maybe had no significance in society. And you made them children of the one true King. Jesus, would you remind us that when we put our trust in you, we are your child. And that you have called us out and have given us purpose and have given us life. Jesus, be with Brother Donnie as he comes to preach this text. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
The songs will never leave me. The songs will never leave me alone. Cry, cry, my son. true you remember the songs that you learned when you were a child they stick in your heart and in your head it's so good to see you this morning it's good to see Woody Woody has had a bit of illness as well but he's back this morning good to see you sir and so as you know there's a lot of illness going around our city and you compound illness with a little bit of cold and so you were brave. Thank you for being brave and getting out and joining us today for worship. Now, Irma and I have some particular shows on TV that we like to watch. One of our favorites is um, Antiques Roadshow. That probably says a lot about our age or something. I'm not sure. Um... It's fun to be able to try to guess what these things might be worth. And if the price of them had gone up or if the price of them had gone down, you never really know. And sometimes you spot something that you've got and you say, oh my goodness, let's go sell that quick. We like several others. We never miss the weather. Well, I say we never miss the weather. Quite frequently, by the time the weather comes on, we fall asleep in our chair. But, you know, the weather was on anyway. But I think one of our most favorite, mostly because we live in this old house, and so we need some help to know on how to fix that thing up. But, you know, we, we learn some things, and we like to see, well, the project started here, and over time, this is what they did, and it turned out looking so nice. And all the people that are there just kind of become like old friends. We've been watching it so long, we know who Bob Villa is. Let's see if anybody knows. Yeah, a few. Oh, but the guys, you know, the ones who are like friends, the names that we always know, Kevin O'Connor, Tom Silva, Norm Abrams. I mean, these guys are so skilled. They can just take a piece of junk and make it look really, really good. Recently, I saw a clip on a guy who's come more, more recent than these older fellas, Mark McCullough. May or may not know any of these names, but Mark had a clip on this old house where he's telling about how he kind of came into the trade that he does. He is a, a mason, a stone mason, brick and stone mason. When he was 13, he started working with a fellow learning this trade. And in the telling of his story, he talked about uh, a guy by the name of, I'll have to check it, Dominique Besidi. Dominique Besidi. Sounds Italian. I bet it is. Um, Mark started working with Dominic when Dominic was 63 years old. And they worked together, and Mark called him my mentor. He mentored me from the time Dominic was 63 until he was 83. I guess it takes a long time to really learn how to be a good stonemason. I've laid a brick or two, but mostly I've just mixed mortar. That's what I'm better at. Just It's a really refined craft. takes a long time to be able to learn it. It takes a long time, really, to learn most any complicated task. So 
you wanted to become a medical doctor. Well, you went to college for four years, and then you went to medical school for three years, and then you took an internship for some more years, and you did a specialty after that so that you could learn exactly what you were going to do. I'm kind of glad they spend that much time learning because the practice of medicine is just not very appealing. I want somebody to not be practicing. I want him to know or her to know what they're doing. It takes a long time to get there. If you wanted to be a commercial pilot or something, you would have to take a goodly number of hours before you could get a basic license. But if you were going to fly for the airlines, hundreds, thousands of hours, and once you finally were able to sit in the co-pilot seat, you would sit there for years before you became the captain, and I'm sort of glad that that's the case. You want them to really know what they're doing. I anything that's complicated, that's sort of hard, takes a long time, and this whole concept of, of mentorship or somebody who helps introduce you to the trade or introduce you to the skill is really a good thing. It is an oddity, though, in life, though it seems like some of the most important tasks that we do, we don't hardly get any preparation for it. Well, for example, you want to get married. You're going to be married for, I hope, a long time. We've been married for about 48 years or so. Yep. She said, yes, I got it right. Now, that's a long time. But do you know how much prep time we had for 48 years? <laughs> I know we lived in the house with my mom and dad, but I, I guess that was good. That was good help. That helped us to know. But for the most part, you say I do, and then you just kind of get thrown in the water to see if you can swim or not. Hope it turns out well, guys. There is no internship that you do. Or what about raising kids? That's almost... There's no, they always say, there's no manual for that. You start out with the first one, and you hopefully make most of your, your mistakes on that one so that, you know, being twisted happens only to one child, and the other ones are okay. But, now nah, the first child's always the best, James. <laughs> but where's the internship to teach you how to raise kids you, you know you just there they are and you stumble along and you hope you don't tear them up too badly before it's all over with I don't know why it's that way but some of the really biggest and most important things in life we don't have an internship program or a mentorship program to help us know how to do it and so all of that brought me to this kind of idea. You know, here we are on a life journey with Christ. What we say is the most important thing that you're going to do in your life is come to know Christ and then to follow Him. And for the most part, the way churches do it is we try to call people to Jesus, come and trust Him, and then we get them baptized, and those are great things. And then it's pretty much, all right, let's watch and see how they do. We don't typically have much of a mentor program or an internship program or a discipleship program, hardly, to get people so that they know what it means to be a follower of Christ. I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. I'm not sure. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's not the way that Jesus did it. Uh, the Bible shows us a pattern of how Jesus helped people to become his followers. In fact, that's the story that I want us to look at as we go into the text that Jim read for us just a while ago. But the, the evidence is that we have not done a very good job of taking people from becoming believers to being mature followers of Christ. Not too many years ago, a pretty good-sized church in Chicago, Illinois, that had been a seeker-sensitive church who did a really good job of bringing people to Christ stopped and took a look at their people. And the concept came from their leadership, not necessarily from the pastor and the ministerial staff, but from leadership within the church as they did a survey of the church. And what they came to see was they had done a good job of making people Christians, but had done a poor job of making people 
disciples. In 2017, Lifeway Research, Lifeway is a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's the part of the convention that prints literature and Bibles and books and various other things, and they have an arm that does research. And in 2017, and this is not a surprise to anybody, but they, they spoke with several thousand young people, people in their 20s, in the late, later, middle to late 20s, and talked to them about their journey from being a young person in school, being in a church, and then what happened after that. What they found was that a full two-thirds of all 18 to 22 year olds who grew up in Protestant church churches in those years between 18 and 22 two thirds of them dropped out of church now some number of them eventually came back but they had been raised in the faith they had been introduced to Christ they had come many of them come to know Christ been a part of our programs and the things that we did and yet this very, very large number of young people, once they got out of this environment, left this environment. It's pretty easy to see, I believe, in the church at large that we've not done a very good job of taking people who become followers of Jesus and help them to become mature followers of Jesus. Uh, how do we do that? I've already alluded to the fact that I believe Jesus had a plan that he used and followed. I don't think it was a plan that Jesus kind of sat there and thought about it and said, ah, that's what I'll do. I believe Jesus knew what the plan was supposed to be and the sovereignty of being God. Our challenge is to know, well, what was the plan that Jesus used to help people to become mature followers of his? A lot of people have talked about this, and a lot of people have written books about it and helped us to think about it. Nobody, I don't think, in our generation, in the last generation or two, has done a better job than a man by the name of Robert E. Coleman. Robert Coleman published a book many years ago called The Master Plan of Evangelism. In his book, he identified eight steps that Jesus used to help people who became his followers become mature disciples, strong followers. And th these were the, the eight that Robert Coleman identified. He said things like, this is what Jesus did. He looked for people who would be learners. He stayed with them, or they stayed with him. He showed them how the kingdom was to come. He taught them obedience. He involved them in ministry. He kept them growing and going. He expected them to reproduce and in the end, he trusted them into the hands of the Holy Spirit. If you're interested, I mean, his book is a classic, The Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert Coleman. You can find it very easy online if you're interested in reading the book. It's really good. It's a little bit older, and some people have updated it somewhat so that it's more, that it speaks easier to current generation. But nobody really has improved on describing the plan that Jesus used to make mature followers of Christ. The text that Jim read for us a little while ago from Mark chapter 3, I think, kind of in a nutshell, gives us the plan that, that Jesus used. I want today to look at that, and I, I'm going to want for a few Sundays to kind of elaborate on his plan as we do some exploration into what I'm going to call a biblical strategy for making disciples. We're not stumbling along here in the direction that we're trying to go or the direction that I am speaking to you from. We have talked about a, a vision. I've just about beat that horse to death, but I'm going to beat him some more. Not today, because it just seems to me that it is Biblical. It is Christ-centered for a people of God to have a visual image in front of them that's compelling and draws them into doing what Christ would have us do. And that's what we've tried to present as we've talked about, here is a vision. We think it's from God. Leadership has bought into it. 
we are starting to talk about it. We catch the phrases. We start getting a glimpse of what it means if we lived into something like that to see every life in Jasper transformed by Christ. Can you imagine? What kind of people would we have to be to see something like that take place? And I know we can't drive every person being transformed by Christ, but can we be obedient to Christ to say, here is what's going to pull us into the way Christ would have us live in the future. But I have said to many, and some of you have heard it, many of you probably have heard it, if we know where we are and we think we know where God would have us go, how do we get from A to B? How do we make that gap? How do we move from where we are to where God would have us be? And I don't know, I hope it doesn't sound like of the world or that it's too military-based. My family came out of a military background, so I guess the language of the military sometimes has, to, has stuck with me. But I've described it in terms of strategy. I know that's not a biblical word, but I think it is a biblical concept that you know where you are, you have a vision of where Christ would take you, you sense this is not the end, but this is where we see it going. How do we get there? And I think that what He would have us do above all else comes straight from the Great Commission, and it's given to us several times in Scripture, that we would make disciples of all nations and baptize them and teach them and lead them into maturity of faith. I think that's what would move us along. That's what He would have us do. And so what is a strategy? What is a strategy for that to take place? I don't want to go outside of Scripture to try to find something that would give us marching orders. I think the passage that we read a little while ago, as I've already said, is sort of like, in a nutshell, the plan, the strategy that Jesus used to take this group of ragtime, rag time, no, they weren't quite to ragtime, were they yet? I try to do that, but I just... I can't, so let's not even go there. So ragtag, it was what it was supposed to be. So to take this group of ragtag guys and girls and make them into a strong force for the kingdom of God. I think, here you go, you've kind of got a lot of it right here in this passage. There will be more that we'll have to look at, but, but look at the passage that we read just a little while ago. It's from Mark chapter 3, from 13 down to 19. And it probably, when we read it, it went by so quick that you might have not already parsed out some of the stuff in there. But it starts by Jesus Himself going up on a mountain and summoning those whom he, that He wanted, and, and, and they came to Him. This exact, there is a parallel passage for Mark chapter 3 in Luke chapter 6. It's the same story. In Luke chapter 6, it tells that part about Jesus going up into the mountain, and it said that the night before this event happened where he selected these 12 guys, the night before, he went up into the mountain and he prayed. And in fact, the text in Luke says he prayed all night. I tried to do that a couple of times when I was younger. Now I can't make it through the news or the weather. You know, it's like, I've already confessed that. I fall asleep before it's over with. What'd they say, Irma? I don't know. I fell asleep too. Well, but when I was younger, tried to stay up with a group of people all night long praying. We did not make it. It's not easy to stay up all night. You probably will not do it unless you've got some real burning issue. And here was the burning issue for Jesus. Who are these people that I'm going to call to myself who will be my closest core out of which we will reach the world? And so he spent all night praying. The, the first step in his collecting a group of people that would be very close to him, that would carry out the plan of changing the world, started with him spending time with God in prayer. Not a bad idea. Prayer cannot be perfunctory. Prayer's got to be serious. It's got to be practiced. It's got to be intentional. It's got to be something that drives our lives, a part of our life every day. In fact, 
when the scripture talked about prayer, it talked about prayer as being an unceasing practice that we are involved in. It's not that, well, you know, three times a day before I eat, I say my prayers. And we do that. We do that in my family. We say that sort of intentional verbal prayer, but that's not, that's not the focus of all of our prayer life. The example of how you pray, especially when you're going to think about something as serious as how do we equip people to become mature followers of Christ, we need to spend quite a bit of time with God in prayer. And so that's where Jesus started. He went up on the mountain, he spent some time with God, and then he called these guys to himself, according to Mark. He called them and they came. There was a, there was a two-sided peace in the way this next step happened there is that Jesus had in his mind who these people were supposed to be and he deliberately called them out. But he didn't force their hand. There's this really cool scene in um, The Chosen. I, I, some of you, I think, probably have been watching The Chosen. There are two seasons of it. I've made reference to it before. Uh, Irma and I have watched both of the seasons. I think there's seven episodes in each season. It's really a pretty good presentation of the life of Christ. It doesn't. It, it focuses on Jesus, but the title gives you some sense of what it's about. The chosen. Immediately you think, oh, Jesus is the chosen one. But the emphasis in this set of videos, this story, the telling the story of Jesus' life, is not so much that he was the chosen. He was. But he chose people to come and follow him. And so the stories are telling about the ones that he chose, the chosen. There's this one really interesting scene where it's not in the Bible, but these videos give some possible background. It follows quite a bit of story about Nicodemus. And it shows in the chosen, so it's not in the Bible, don't get me wrong but in the way that the creators of this show made it, Nicodemus had several encounters with Jesus, the lengthy one at night where they had this long conversation, and that Nicodemus knew in his heart that he needed to be a follower of Jesus, and that in fact Jesus was calling him to be a follower, sort of like the other twelve, before he had called the twelve by name. Jesus was about to leave out of Capernaum and he had made this suggestion to Nicodemus that he meet them in the courtyard at a particular time and Nicodemus came and he stood by the wall. It was a good show. <laughs> and so Jesus with a handful of people are gathered there and Jesus kind of keeps looking back toward Nicodemus. Is this everyone? Are they all here? And poor old Nicodemus just crumples over by the wall and weeps because he can't do it. He can't leave his life. Now, I know that's a make-believe story. It's a possible background. But the, the point of it was, in this text, Jesus called and these people came. There are both of those aspects he does not force our hand. He calls us to Himself. He opens the door. He gives us the opportunity. He lays in front of us the absolute best possible life that a human can live, following Christ. And you can say yes, or you can say no. I hope you will say yes. Because I will say to you as clearly as I know how there is no alternative life that this world can give you that can compare to the life that Christ can give you and so he called them and these guys said yes and then it's got this terrific section this great verse verse 14 that just goes by so quick that you almost miss it he appointed twelve so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach. Now there are, there are three little quick things I want to say about that. Is that he called out of this larger group of followers twelve people that would be very close to him. 
it's easy to think that perhaps Jesus neglected the others and the only ones he really cared about were the ones that were up close to him. That is not true whatsoever. We know from reading the gospel stories that Jesus was close to a great many people. Uh, we, we were, were looking last Sunday night. We'll be following up this Sunday night with the final one of the seven signs in the book of John. The final one of the seven signs in the book of John is the resurrection of Lazarus. And the scripture says that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were beloved people to Jesus. They were his dear friends. And when Lazarus died, even though Jesus knew he was going to call him out of the tomb, Jesus wept for the pain of the, what had, the, the family had faced, I guess, and other things. So there's an example of, of three in a family that were very close to Jesus who weren't part of the twelve. We know there were others who were very close to Jesus. He, he had a core group, and he was with these ones. But it's sort of like he had expanding circles of influence. There were the close ones, and there were many that were very dear friends to him, like Mary and Martha and Lazarus and others. There were 120 that were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and these were people who were serious followers of Jesus. We know that there were some of those who had been with Jesus from the very beginning because when Judas Iscariot killed himself, well, they decided they would replace him with somebody who had been witnesses to everything that Jesus had done. So you see, the twelve were not the only ones. They were very close, and Jesus had a peculiar relationship with them. But there were a lot of other people that were close to Jesus and loved Jesus and followed Jesus that he was grooming, so to speak, helping them to grow to become mature followers of Christ. Well, and then there were lots of more people who knew who he was, and many of them became followers of Christ. They weren't in that core group that Jesus was investing so much time with, but there were thousands that came and listened to him preach. There were thousands of thousands who came whenever he would feed them. I think they were Baptists. Oh, the Methodists do the same thing, except they dance when they do it. So Jesus did not neglect the others. Here was an intentional plan of Jesus that when Jesus is gone, He has hung the future of the Christian movement on the hands and backs of this group of 12 men that they will carry out and do what He's called them to do. So how did He lead these guys to know and to feel and to be obligated to, from the inside to desire more than anything else to live out this life that Jesus had called them to do. How did he get that burden on them? Here it is. He lived with them. He shared life. He was with them. We don't know how long. Per, perhaps early in his ministry, something toward the middle that he called the twelve and it's just, we can't pin it down exactly. What we do know is the exact strategy. The strategy was he lived his life with these men. So he taught them how they were to do this, but even more than that, they caught from him how they were supposed to do it. They saw the way he lived. They heard the things he said. They saw him whenever he was hungry or when he was tired or when he was frustrated. You know, all the things of life, they saw it because they were actually living with him. I don't know if they went home from time to time or went off and ran an errand. Or, I don't know how all that unfolded. We only know from Scripture was the vast amount of time between the calling of the twelve and the death of Jesus, he was physically living with these people. So all the things he did, all the things he said, they were there with him. They saw how he lived. They heard the words that he said. They saw him interact with people who were hurting. They saw him interact with children. They saw him help people who were sick. They saw him touch the leper. All of that stuff. They caught it from living with Jesus. And as they caught it from sharing life with him, then he laid on them the task. And that's what it says in 14 and 15. First, he was with them, 
And then he sent them out to preach and to cast out demons. So there were, there were a twofold piece there in the sending out. The first part of it was, was to preach. Now, I don't think that that necessarily meant that they were like a pastor. You know, I, I stand up here and I preach. Well, perhaps they did some stuff that was somewhat formal to that. They went from place to place, I guess, and on occasion and went in the synagogue and they would teach and proclaim the word. They probably did a lot of it in fields or in people's homes or wherever they happened to go. And it's not so much that they had, okay, well, here's my sermon for the day. It's got three points, and it's got a couple of nice little points in there, and y'all sit down, and I'll preach this to you. They were, they were just telling forth the story, the message. And the message was, the wording may have been somewhat different, but the heart of the message was exactly the same as what we say even now. That in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, human beings can come into a right relationship with God, the creator of the universe. And apart from a relationship with Jesus, who lived and died and rose, apart from knowing Him and trusting Him and following Him, you cannot have a right relationship with the God of the universe who created all things. And so it's an important message. It's the story they told, and it's still the story we tell. Now there's more that we talk about as we do the whole Scripture, as we give the Word of God, and yet the heart of what we preach is that. It is the heartbeat. It is the message. It is what makes a difference. It what changes people's lives and changes communities that here was Jesus, who was God Himself, who lived among us. And He taught us all this stuff. And He showed us what God is like. And He died on the cross for our sin and rose from the dead and still lives. There's the heart of the gospel. So that was the first part of what they did. And then they cast out demons. Well, now casting out demons is not something that we practice very much anymore, at least not within our American Western culture. When my wife and I visited our children who live in the an Eastern culture. We were at a large gathering of worship and probably a couple of thousand of people there and there was a fellow who kind of went berserk and I wasn't very close by but later on the pastor said yes well it, it happens in this culture. It wasn't a manifestation of a mental illness. It was a manifestation of demonic possession. I wasn't going to question him. He knows his culture and his people better than I know. Whatever else you say about this text, you, I don't think we have any other conclusion if we're going to be biblical but to say that there is a real enemy and that enemy is demonic and that enemy has forces that are at his marshal that he can call up. And we war against that in various ways. And even though I have never seen what I could say was a demon possession and participated in an exorcism, they did then. And that some cultures even do still today. I will mostly leave it at that. But I will say that every time Jesus sent out 12 or 70 into the community to work, part of what they did was related to demon possession and part of it was related to healing and part of it was related to doing good and Jesus fed them and he healed the sick and in everything they did they encountered the brokenness of human beings around them and responded to it here it was described in demon possession but in every act of the people of God we reach out to the hurt the hurt and the harm of humanity and offer help in the name of Christ, a cup of cold water, an act of kindness, some kind of good that makes differences in people's lives. Some people will never hear you talk about God until you take care of a hungry belly. And so the people of God, when they are sent out by Christ, carry a message that is an imperative for the world, and we carry acts of love that will point people towards Jesus. 
And so in living with them, in Jesus living with them, they saw that this is exactly what He did. They learned it from Him. And look what it did to these guys. Now, most of the time you read the, you read the names of the apostles there, and you just kind of zip right on by it. About half of them, we know almost nothing about them. We know that several of them were fishermen. We know several of them were brothers. But in this short list here, there are just a couple of little spots there I would point very quickly for your attention. Look at what it did to these guys. He called them to Himself. He lived with them. He trusted them with the work. He sent them out to do what He had been doing, and their lives were vastly changed. You start out with Simon, who was, I mean, he was, my father was a sailor. I know what sailors can be like. Now, Daddy was a Christian as well. But before he became a Christian, there were, there were hints and rumors of stories that I heard about his pre-Christian life as, as, a, as a sailor. I guess fishermen can be pretty tough guys. He was a pretty tough guy. But at the same time, He's the guy who said when Jesus talked about the cross, Peter said, no, it's not going to happen that way. And Jesus had to say, get behind me, Satan. It was Peter who supposedly had such dedication to Jesus that no matter what happened, he would follow Jesus. And he denied him three times when it got really critical and the last time by cursing and swearing. I don't know the man. Somehow, Jesus took this fellow and made him a rock. He wasn't a rock until Christ made him a rock. And then there were these couple of brothers who described as sons of thunder. Now, uh, that wasn't in your text. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Boragonese or something. Who knows? None of us know how to pronounce that one. It's Aramaic for sons of thunder. And then the other one is Greek. So <laughs> these guys apparently had explosive tempers. That's as best as I know how to describe it. Sons of thunder, Jesus called them. Every once in a while, they got a little out of hand. They want Jesus to call down a little bit of lightning and burn some folks up. You know, take care of those Samaritans. And so Jesus takes these guys who are explosive in their temper and are hard to control, and one of them becomes the first martyr for the sake of Christ, gave his life to the last drop. And the other one wrote five of the, of the books that are in the New Testament. Ends up being the only one who lives to old age. That's John. Has a natural death, but he gave his life to the last drop, giving himself to Christ. He had been just an explosive temper kind of guy, and Jesus changed him radically. And then you've got a guy like Matthew, who is Levi in some of the other lists. They're the same person. He was a tax collector, a publican. He was hated above everybody else. You know this story. He was hated above everybody in Jewish life because he was a collaborator with the Romans. He taxed his own people, cheated them out of more than that they even had to pay. And so nobody, nobody, nobody liked tax collectors except the other tax collectors. There was, there was sort of a religious political group at the time of Jesus called the Essenes, among other religious political groups. And these guys hated the Romans as much or more than anybody else. And the Essenes had a radical right arm who were so, um, so violently opposed to Rome that the way you got into this little group of Essenes was by assassinating a tax collector. And so, this little group of 12 that Jesus took had a tax collector and had a zealot. And it was the zealots who pledged to assassinate tax collectors. How do you do that? How do you take a radical Democrat and a radical Republican and put them in the same group and say, love each other? <laughs> it only happens 
when you have lived with the master and he changes you to such a degree that all the things that used to concern me are pretty much rubbish so that I may know Christ. And so, Jesus reveals a strategy of living with them, mentor, disciple, passing on the life to these ones and then trusting them with the message and sending them out to do it. Radically changed men and women by the power of Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, we have set our face towards a radical Christianity, a following Christ that moves us out of our comfort zone to the place where our passion is to see men and women and young people in our community and beyond whose lives are transformed. How will we do that? Well, we won't be able to be commonplace. We probably won't be able to be a lot of what we've been before if we're going to do this. We're going to have to live with Jesus beyond what we've ever done before. And we're going to have to live with one another. Now, you're not all going to come over my house and live. I would love it, but my wife would get tired of cooking. And actually, she loves the cooking. It's the cleaning up afterwards that's hard. So we're not going to like physically move in with one another, but we're going to need to find ways to have life on life where we're going to disciple one another in a way that changes our lives. Like Jesus discipled his disciples, mentored them, brought them along. They saw how you live it. We're going to be talking about how we live life on life like that. And then I think, I hope more than ever before, we're going to be on mission with Christ, sharing the story, doing what is necessary to heal the brokenness of the people around us. I think that's the directions that he's taking us. And so, I am not going to call you to this. I don't have the authority to do so. But I think Jesus called these twelve and they came. So perhaps in the Sundays ahead we'll get this more clear and we'll see what's involved in the call. And then you will have opportunities to say count me in or that's too much for me. We'll see. Where is he taking us? We don't know everything. I think we're starting to see more and more. I hope you come along for the ride of your life. We come to the end of this time where we've dealt with God's Word. I don't know what he would say to you out of this simple text. But I know he would call me and you to life change. Well, wait, 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 wait. I'm already a Christian. I thought I did that already. (laughs) It's the epic journey, friends. It's the trip of a lifetime. There are more turns down the road. We've just begun to see what God will do to us and in us and among us. So yeah, it's almost like change every Sunday (laughs) as He calls us further up and deeper in. 
We're going to sing together. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Great words. Would you make it a prayer? I don't know what the Lord would say to you. If there are decisions that you need to make in a public fashion, we are here to talk with you and to pray with you. And if there are decisions that need to be made right there where you stand or sit, you make those too, would you? As we sing together. Let's stand. Have I no the words of the song being being with you well that's one we've sung since we were infants in it have thine own way have thine own way thank you everyone for being with us today come on up Jim I, I know that many of you are aware that um, I'm going to have a short meeting over in the Family Life Center some of you might be interested in going together to Israel in 2023 it's a lovely trip I'll share some information, and if there are enough people who are interested, well, we'll try to do that together. All right, Jim. Are y'all usually seated when I give announcements? Okay, y'all can sit down for a second. <laughs> um, listen, before I go through our weekly uh, schedule, I just want to let you guys know from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock today, uh, Allison and a few of our adults are going to be hosting a food and fun and game day in our gym for our FBC kids. That's kindergarten through 6th grade, and so if you've got a kindergarten through 6th grader that would like to come back and, and hang out this afternoon, uh, they're going to be getting together at 3, and they'll be here all the way through 6 for whenever our, our evening worship ends. So that'll bring me to 5 o'clock. We are having youth uh, in the youth room from 5 to 6. And we are having evening worship in here from 5 to 6. And then you'll be able to leave with your kiddos after that, uh, after they've had uh, gotten all sugared up in the gym and played lots of games together. So this uh, Wednesday, we are having our normal schedule. We've got um, dinner at 5. And if you need to sign your family up, we've got that QR code in the bulletin that you can use your phone to scan and Go ahead and fill out that info, or just call the church office and let us know how many are coming. We've got at 6 o'clock the kids in the gym. We've got youth in the youth room. We've got the ladies' Bible study that's been meeting in the computer lab, and then prayer meeting uh, right here in the sanctuary. And all that's going to be from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. Um, one quick note. It's in your bulletin about February 5th. Uh, we're going to be having a work day at East Texas Baptist Encampment in Newton. Now, there are a lot of projects uh, that are going on over there. They are 
going to be completely rebuilding uh, a lot of different structures. But before we can uh, rebuild on that foundation, we've got to tear things up. And so this is going to be mostly a demo day. So something good I can do. <laughs> and no skilled labor required. We're going to be meeting here at 8.30. That's February 5th, Saturday morning. Uh, Jerry Clifton is going to be kind of heading that group up and telling us what to do. But I want to encourage you to take part um, in this ministry that the camp provides. Our church uses it. Tons of churches in the surrounding counties use it. Bound by the Golden Triangle, they use it. Uh, East Texas Baptist Encampment is being used, and there are great days ahead for it. And we want to be a part of that ministry, and we want to give of our time and our labor to, to help them in their ministry. The gospel is, uh, is being shared, and there are thousands of kids that will be there this summer that the gospel will be shared with. So February 5th, Saturday at 8.30. One more thing before we dismiss, uh, and we do apologize, but there will be no nursery available tonight. So from 5 to 6, we will not have a nursery available. We've just got a few medical things going on with our volunteers and uh, so they're going to take a short break. Thank you so much. If you're a senior adult, we will have happy years this week, Tuesday. Would you stand and let's sing once again?